Good morning. Welcome to this morning's service. It's a pleasure to be here today um, to worship together the Lord. I'm going to ask if you're able to, if you can stand up with us, and if you can join us in singing this song. And tell the Lord, and let us tell the Lord that he's beautiful, that he's wonderful, um, and that we want to see him. We want to see his glory this morning. Amen. More beautiful, beautiful, that's what you are to me. Beautiful, beautiful, in every way you are wonderful, wonderful, that's what you are to me. Jesus, Jesus, there's no way I could ever describe you, and nobody could ever compare. I can't stop thinking about you, Jesus. You can search the world for something that's greater Keep on looking cause you'll never find A love like this can never explain it Oh, oh, oh. I'm gonna sing You are beautiful, beautiful That's what you are to me Beautiful, beautiful in every way You are wonderful, wonderful That's what you are to me Jesus there's no way I could ever describe you and nobody could ever compare I can't stop thinking about you Jesus oh you can search the world for something that's greater keep on looking cause you'll never find a love like this can never Half of us are over there getting ready for our picnic, but uh, you can enjoy sitting here as they get ready for it. 
Uh, we begin today with our confession. This is the time we read the Apostles' Creed because it's Communion Sunday. And so we use a historical uh, document and confession from the history of the church. So as we read this, let us believe and read. So, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for this day where we can come into your house and worship you freely without restraint or fear, that we can live in spirit and in truth. We can worship you. We can sing about you. We can pray to you. We can comfort each other, encourage one another, and be your children. Help us to learn, to give thanks and to be light in the darkness. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand if you're able to, and let us continue worshiping the Lord this morning. You know, we've waited for, for Sunday to come around and for us to be able to get um, together to worship the Lord.
your name. The word of God says that by his grace we have been saved. And we thank the Lord for his amazing grace this morning.
were slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. worship you. And thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your mercy. We just want to worship you this morning and lift up our hands, Lord, in signs of gratitude, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so This is right. 
if you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so Our first reading for today comes from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Not on yet? Let me see. Okay, is that better? There we go. Okay. So our first reading is from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. And our second reading today is from Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in teaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last my God's by God's will, the way will, may be open for me to come to you. I long to see, to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a, a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for this time and um, for allowing us to gather here today, Lord, in person and on Zoom. I pray that you speak through Pastor Dennis um, this morning and may we all be open to receive from your word. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. OK, 
Okay, I'll, I think I'll try to make this short. I always do, but it never works. But one, because we have a party to go to, and two, before the heat rises in here. This week I've been thinking about blessings. Obviously, it's been a tough week um, with the events that have happened. I, I do want to announce Dan's uh, memorial service is next Sunday night at 6.30 in here. Um, then there'll be a reception afterwards. I hope that everybody who can can come uh, just to show support to the Salas family. Uh, this weekend, they're up at uh, Jennifer's house in Vacaville, uh, but we've been working with them, and they're going through all the things you go through when somebody suddenly passes. So it's kind of, I wandered around all week like uh, in a daze, wondering, you know, it's just one of those shocks. But I was thinking about blessings. So remember, next Sunday night, 6.30. How blessed we are. When, when events like this happen, obviously, uh, you think, whoa, you know, we need to make the most of time. And you never know when your time is up or somebody else's time up. And, and one of the, my truly great faults, uh, uh, I have a lot of them, but uh, that I know God has spoke to me many times about is living in the now. I'm not really good at that. I always am looking something ahead um, or worried about something behind. And most of us are not really good at that, you know, that today is given to us and it may be our last day. Do we enjoy it or are we thinking about something that's going to happen next weekend or something next month? Or, you know, I always looked at kind of the calendar that went up till 4th of July and then now it's downhill to Christmas, you know. And so you can't live if you're always looking forward to something. And this is why we celebrate 4th of July. I mean, I've been to a lot of countries in the world, people. And there's very few countries ever that people can be thankful for their country. Uh, they've had major coups. They have major wars. They have major poverty. And yeah, we're not, you know, doing great all the time. But, you know, you're talking about 250 years almost of... Uh, a country that has been blessed. And so that's why it's probably one of the few holidays that you'll see celebrated in churches because it means something different to everybody else. But it does mean we are, like I said at the beginning, we're in here and we're free. You know, we don't have to worry about soldiers coming in. We don't have to worry about somebody looking for us. Uh, we've been in a country that has been very blessed. And so blessing is something that Paul is very aware of you know, because of what he says and does. This is why I think this is very important. We're doing Romans, you know. we. I want to just tell you something, I mean, to say this. Last week we had a guest minister, right? And he was, you know, I think I can announce, I don't know. He was trying out for another church and they were looking at him. But on Monday he wrote me and he said, I don't think I've ever been in a service that was so moving as yours just from our worship and our prayers and stuff. You know, and you think, well, it was just another Sunday. But for some people that have been dry wells, it's like a fire hose was turned on. The worship and, and the things. We forget how blessed we are. And so it was, to me, it was really encouragement. But we're in Romans. We came out of Galatians. It's totally different. We know this. It's, it's uh, written about 50 between 50 and 55, they think, they debate over all these things. But most people believe it was Paul that wrote it. So that's beyond mostly debatable subject. And uh, it was really written to, with two words in, in, in order, faith and righteousness, where are, you're going to see going through the whole thing. And um, he wants to also present the gospel and heal divisions. Because there's problems in Rome like there always are in the early church. Most of it because of the culture around it. Uh, and he starts off with Paul and the servant. And he talks about, and we used this word last week, doulos, uh, a love slave, a servant. To Paul, that was what every Christian was called to. We find it offensive. You know, we're not going to tell anybody we're a slave to somebody. It's an offensive word we don't even use. But to Paul... It had a different meaning. Uh, you can 
back it down to servant or you can back down to willing help or whatever you want to call to make it comfortable. But what Paul saw was, listen, and we'll see this through this passage here. God has done so much throughout history, through Jesus, that when we come into a relationship with God the way God wants us to, we have no other position but to really totally serve. Not only based on who God is, but what God wants. I mean, if you could run your life, and most people this is what they do as Christians, or let God run your life, which one do you think would be better? Do you think that God really knows how to run your life better than you do? I, I would hope so. But we don't. We always think, well, yeah, God's a good guy, faithful, and Jesus is good, but, you know, I got to make these decisions about where I live, where I go to school, who I marry, who, how many kids they have, all sorts of things. Well, if you're doing that, you're not understanding what Paul is talking about a do loss. A do loss doesn't do that. Uh, they ask their master permission for things. You get to ask a loving, caring God that only wishes for your highest good. And, and that is what Paul's trying to get to him. So when we read words like this, it's not a subservient type of growl, groveling position. It's a position of honor to know that your life could be run by the most loving, creative God in the universe. That he has goodness for you. The Bible's all full of this. And, and we'll see this when we come here. And he uh, said he's set apart. Now, this is interesting. He said he's an apostle. Apostolos is the Greek. But he said, I'm set apart for the gospel. And most people would say, whoa, I wish I was like that. We well, all are. We're all set apart for the gospel. Every one of you has been set from this present evil age for the gospel. And I was thinking about this. Well, how do we talk about this? You know, Paul was gifted. He was brilliant. I mean, I wish they had recorded the miracles that Paul did. In the early church, the apostles, when they came into a town, were known for the gospel being in power. They, they you know, healings, raising from the dead you know, casting out demons. This was normal because of the culture they lived in. It almost had to be, you know, when we go to Africa, a lot of it is a power encounter. It's not truth encounter. It isn't like you got to convince somebody that there's a God that you can't see. They all believe in the gods you can't see, but they don't want to know, is your God real? Can he, is he powerful? Let's see it. This is what Paul's talking about. And so he said, I'm set apart. So I was thinking about this and God gave me this image because remember, if we go back to Galatians, one of the things we're really trying to work on is God had a promise to Abraham. And he said, Abraham, through your seed, Jesus Christ, I'm going to build one family to bless all the nations. So that's an ultimate goal of God is to build one family and to bless nations. So how do we fit in? So I had this image of crossword puzzle. I'm not big on crossword puzzles. I find them frustrating. My wife loves them. I find them frustrating. You know, I just want to, I saw a show the other night, and it was great. The woman was just cutting the corners so, off the pieces so they'd all fit. I thought, no, that's a good idea. I could do that. But we have to think of ourselves as a puzzle piece. Some of you are very weirdly shaped. And you look at it and go, this thing's useless. But it could be the key piece in the puzzle. And what we're like as a church, this church, is if you saw a beautiful sunset, a whole panoramic view of Yosemite as this great big jigsaw puzzle, we might be one plant in the corner. But each one of us is part of that. We can't be whole unless everybody that they're set apart to do is doing it. And as we come together, we make a plant. And as we learn to have fellowship with other Christians, the picture becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, worldwide, it becomes a whole picture of the Valley of Yosemite that would bless the nations. So you have to envision this as your life, that you may look at yourself and say, wow, I'm a weird little piece. Yeah, you probably are. We all are. 
but you may be that center piece. You know how you get down to the end and you're looking for that one piece and you can't find it. All of a sudden you find it and you put it in and whoa, this is amazing. This is what Paul's talking about. I've been set apart. I have a part to play. He's an apostle. There's no doubt about it. But an apostle, as contrary to today, we elevate apostles. They did the opposite. Apostles were one who came and served everybody. Just as Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so Paul is saying, we are come to serve one another. He's talking now. He was talking to Galatians. A church him and Barnabas founded. Now he's talking to a church he's never even been to. He doesn't know anybody there. But he said, it doesn't matter. I'm here to serve, as you should be here to serve. And so we're like that jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes it doesn't make sense because we don't see what God sees. That's why I'm saying, do you trust God with your life? Do you trust God with healing? Or do you guard things in your life thinking you know better than God? Well, when you do that, your peace isn't fitting right because we're not freely letting God have a free hand on us to work in us. And so, but as we come together, that's what it is. And so he finishes up and he talks about Jesus being fully human, as descended to David, fully God, that he was resurrected, and he ends up with calling us saints. That's in the first part of that. Now, he comes to that stage. It's funny because he said, first of all, I'd like to say this, but never in the Romans does he ever say what the second part was or third part. But he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ for you. I mean, can you imagine? We have a hard time with people, Christians, sometimes with people in our own church, but he's able honestly to thank God for people he's never even met because they love Jesus. You know, we have to enlarge our worldview, you know, and you're going to see this. He prays for them. Well, it's like us praying for Christians in the Ukraine or in Russia or China, North Korea. That's what we're called to do. We have this power to do it. He doesn't know them But he said, I thank God for you. Why? Because God has done a work. Can you imagine? I mean, we think about our own lives. I look back on my lives, and like I tell people, most of the time you will see God's work in your life in the rearview mirror. You will not see it now. I pray for things all the time now. Most of them don't happen now. But when I look back over my life, because now on the 4th of July is my Christian birthday, I became a Christian 53 years ago. When I look back over 53 years, I see God's hand here, there, here, there, there, stopping me, blessing me, leading me very clearly. This is what he's talking about. Do you trust God to do that? Paul does. He just said, well, I I don't really have control of my own life because I'm doing, I want to do what God wants me to do. It's not that you just give up and do nothing. We're not talking about that. God gave you a brain. There's not a problem here. But you know in your heart who's you're trying to glorify. Are you trying to glorify yourself or are you trying to glorify God and what you do? And so Paul is saying, They were amazed, but they weren't amazed at the quality of the Christians. It wasn't like, oh, man, you guys have a a really great church, and you're known for your worship, or you're known for your gifts, or you're known for your piety, or anything like that. It's very clear that what Paul's saying is, the reason I thank God, there's Christians in Rome. What an amazing thing. It's like people talk to me. I saw something the other day. Somebody wrote and said, you think you have life so bad? There are people that still live in California. And I wrote, I don't try not to comment on Facebook, but I had to. Yeah, and I love living here. You know, because people, that's what they thought. It's like Silicon Valley. It's like, you know, God stops at Nevada, you know, and he, well, he stops back behind Reno in Las Vegas, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, that's what they think, you know, and they're amazed. I've seen people, they, they don't believe there's any Christians in San Francisco. 
Yet there's great moves of God. And that's what Paul is saying. I mean, Rome, the center of the universe at this time, and the most cultured city and pagan gods and all this stuff, he said, I thank God on you. Why? Because there's Christians there. And nobody did it. There were no mission trips to Rome like he did to Galatia. God did a sovereign work, and God does sovereign works. I mean, you can talk about revivals in China and North Korea and places where they didn't send teams in there. But God got a hold of somebody and changed the course of people. That's what Paul is saying. I thank God for you guys. But I thank God because it's a sovereign work that God did. And so he, and he said, I'm going to come and I'm going to give you some, yeah, I want to come and give you gifts. So how does he say it? He says, you know, for God is a witness and I serve in my spirit, his son without ceasing intention. Oh, uh, uh, according to his son, and I want to come and strengthen you with gifts. Now, and then all of a sudden he stops and he goes, wait a second. I'm not trying to give you an impression that I am coming to you because I'm special and you aren't. Because he talks about mutual giving. And when he's talking about gifts, most people associate to him that he's going to bring healing or miracles or casting demons out or, or these type of gifts, the spiritual gifts, prophecy, tongues, all those things. That's not what he's talking about. He doesn't use the charismata in that way. He's talking about, I want to come to edify you. I want to come to share my life with you. And by the way, I want you to share my li your life with me. Because as Christians, when I meet another Christian, and anybody that's been on mission trips knows this, you meet somebody halfway around the world, and within an hour, they're like your best friend. How could that happen? I don't know their history. I don't know their relatives. I don't know where they went to school. I don't know anything about them. But there's something about the Spirit connecting to the Spirit. And we edify each other. I mean, people will tell you this a thousand times. You go on a mission trip and you come back and you go, how? Did you really bless them? And you say, well, I don't really know who was blessed more, them or me. And I go and teach, but just meeting people and what they've done and their character and what God's done in their life just enriches my life because we edify each other. And that's what it's supposed to be. We bring to the table the spirit within us. And you can do that every day of your life to other Christians. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, some people expect somebody to teach them or instruct them. Well, that's fine. But you also have the gift within you to share with other people. And you also have the gift. I'm probably skipping ahead here. But um, you have the gift to infuse the Holy Spirit into the situation. Let me tell you, the greatest blessing for me as a teacher is, and I don't know if they're here, so I, and I can't remember who it was, so I, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but somebody talked to me, and they were on a plane, and the person next to them was, had a headache. And I said, well, what'd you do? Well, I leaned over and prayed for them. I was shocked. And they looked at me and said, well, isn't that what you teach us to do? I went, yeah, but I didn't know you were listening, you know. But the thing about it is that's what edifies me. When I give instruction that I believe God is giving and people incorporate it and they're using it in their lives and demonstrating their lives, I get richly blessed by that because, wow, we're doing this. We're all doing this. And that's what Paul is trying to say to him. Listen, I want to come and, and give you a gift, but the gift is we're going to have mutual blessing to each other. And he talks about faith here. And there's really three types of faith that Paul is kind of discussing. The first one is covenantial faith. And covenantial faith is based on a covenant made by God. We have an Abrahamic, a Mosaic, an Adamic, and also a Davidic covenant that's made. Somebody made it. I have faith because you promised me something in writing. You know, okay, when you turn 21, I'm going to give you $100,000. Here it is. It's signed by the lawyers. The money's in the bank. So I can have faith that when I turn 21, this is going to happen because there's been a covenant made. And the thing about God is the trustworthiness of who he is. You know, faith, when it comes down to it, 
doesn't have anything to do with what you believe. That's what you think. Well, I have faith because I believe. No, that's not what Paul's talking about. Faith doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with God. You know, it's kind of like some of you may understand how a plane works. You know, I prefer big planes. I don't like little planes. But they work, I guess. I'm just not going to try it. But when I come to a plane and I'm getting on a jet, I don't go up and go, you know, I believe this thing will fly. And because I believe it's going to fly, it's going to fly. Sorry, none of you do that. But you know that trustworthy, that plane has probably flown thousands of times and hundreds of thousands of times other planes have flown. The trustworthiness is in the plane, not in whether you believe it can fly. You can't change that. But it's the trustworthiness. That's what faith is. That in pistos in the first century, in Roman times, it had more to do with the trustworthiness of the person that you have faith in. Not in how, how much God has proven to you. Because some of you, God is, could tell, you could tell 10,000 stories of God's faithfulness. Some of you still are trying to figure out, is God really blessing me? And that's how I am. Some days, oh God, you're so close. Some days I go, are you real? I don't know. I have doubts. We all do this. And the Bible says your heart can make you, you know, can condemn you. Let me tell you, it's not based in what I, who I am. So the covenantal faith and trust is based on the covenant God made, but it's based on who made the covenant. It wasn't that David was so sure or Abraham or them. It wasn't, we're not trusting them. We're trusting God made them. So a lot of times when you talk about the just shall live by faith and stuff, it's the trustworthiness of who you believe in that makes your faith strong. Because otherwise your faith will go up and down. Thomas is a good example. He wanted to believe, but he couldn't. Okay, so you have that. So secondly, you have epistemological faith. And this is what they believe is, so we don't have blind faith. You know, getting on a plane, you pretty have blind faith. I mean, some of you may understand aerodynamics and lift and all that stuff, but most of us just have blind faith. They got two engines on the side. We go in, and so far this plane's made it from A to B, and I'm just going to trust that it gets there too. Okay? But we don't have blind faith because, like I said in the beginning, when you look back into history, in your life and in the life of the world, God has done things over and over and over. It isn't like, oh, we believe in a God. What has he done? I don't know, but he's a God. No, we can look back. We can look at the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I saw a show the other night, and they were talking, and they were trying to explain about Jesus. And they said, well, whether you believe in Jesus or not, God was faithful to have him walk out of that tomb. And to this day, millions of people believe that. God has been faithful. How many people have been healed? How many lives have been transformed? How many governments have been torn down? How many things have happened? You know, John says that if we wrote all the things he did, the books couldn't even contain them. So we don't have blind faith. We see the hand of God. It is real and it has done things. It doesn't do things like we want all the time, nor in the time we want to do it. But if we want to be neutral and look back, you can read all the books of all the things God has done that people have witnessed. And so that, and then there's the ecclesiastical faith. We all have hope for the future. We have faith that there is a place that we will be in the presence of God for eternity. We don't really know what it's like. They, people have imagined and used scripture, but we don't really know what it's like. We even have stories of people that went to heaven and come back, you know, and they're not all the same. So, but we have a faith that when God says, he or she that believes in, in me, even if they die, they will live. That is our ask. You know, we believe in the future for what it is. And that's what Paul is trying to get them to believe. So next, Paul informs them that his prayer life. He said, I prayed for you all. I include you all the time. What kind of prayer life do you have? Most of us pray for our own personal needs or needs of somebody we know. That's it. 
You know, oh God, you know, I have a list I go through, and most of them are for people I know in situations. Uh, it changes depending on situations of people that need healing or people that are grieving or people that, you know, are having hope or trying to make a decision or protection. We do all that. But then Paul is praying for somebody he doesn't even know. He said, I mention you all the time. Do you ever just pray for this church? Do you ever pray for the church in America? Do you ever pray for the church in the world? I mean, prayers move things. And so your prayer life, should you should start enlarging it to be more than, there's nothing wrong with intercession or supplication for your own needs. That's one type of prayer. But you can, the Bible says we can tear down strongholds. We can break enemy power. We can overthrow things in the power of God. And this is what Paul is talking about. I pray for you all the time. Well, why would he pray for Rome? He'd never been there. Because he knew God was doing something. Because he had heard it. He said the whole world. Well, the whole world hadn't heard of Rome's Christians. But in their world they had. Because Rome was a pretty big environment at that time. And the Christians had talked about, oh, do you hear what happened over in Rome? People are being saved. This amazed Paul. Then let's keep praying. Let's hope it enlarges. Let hope it grows. You want to see the culture in America change? Pray people into the kingdom. That's what's going to do it. I don't care what, all the political stuff they talk about this, the woke and the, this, conservative. You want to see people change? Change their heart. You know, who's going to change their heart? Only one person, God. So we need to pray for that. And this is what Paul is talking about. So he says, you know, is your prayer consistent? Is it concerned for people you don't know? Is it for the body here and around the world? And the key word here is faith. There can be no community without faith. This is why we meet together. We have faith. We have faith in each other. We have faith in God. That God is doing something and building us to be something. And it must always start and end with God. It can't be based on a person. It can't even be based on a situation. Oh, we're going to have a revival in this town, change the town. Uh, maybe. But if it doesn't start with God and end with God, it's not going to happen. That's what we forget sometimes. Oh, God, you know, because what we do is a lot of times we'll start with God and then we move on. God, I need to, to do this and I'm praying you believe me and then we go on and do it. Instead of saying, well, wait a second, I want to make sure all the, my steps are ordered of God. You know, now sometimes God is silent. Don't, don't get me, I don't have a direct line when I say, God, I'm buying a new car. Can you give me the location, the model, and the finance? I don't get that. See, so sometimes God has people around. But that's one of the things community is for. I'm amazed. You know, if anybody wants to buy a new car, as far as I'm concerned in this church, just talk to me. I know more about cars than all, probably most of you. And I know people that really know cars and do it. And, but I'm amazed at people that go out and buy cars on their own and end up getting, uh, uh, what's a good word <laughs> I can use? Uh, what? Less than what they should be and somebody took advantage of them. See? And that's just something I do because I love cars. But everybody in here has gifts that if we knew what they are and we work together, you'd know, oh, I want to do this. Well, i got to go talk to them because, you know, God's been using them. That They have that background in doing it. It's not have to do with arrogance, people, you know. It has to do with the community being community. How can I have faith in the community help me if I'm not opening myself up to let the community help me? Okay? So, and... When it says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's what the Bible says. We think, okay, hearing comes by the word, hearing the word of God. Well, Dennis is up there giving us the word of God. No, that's not what the Bible says. Sorry. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. The word is Jesus Christ, folks. It's not the Bible. The Bible is a manual to help you know and learn about the living word. Jesus Christ lives in you by the Spirit. You have the Word. Now, do we divulge in here and learn more about Him? Yes, of course. But when we talk about faith come by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, how can you, and we, let's say we change faith to being trustworthiness, 
How do you become trustworthy with God? Well, you have to have God show you how trustworthy God is. Who does that? Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Just because you read it in here doesn't mean you know that it's true. But let me tell you, when you let the Spirit actively lead you and guide you and encourage you through other people, then it becomes, oh man, God is trustworthy. I've trusted him time and time again, and he has not failed me. Sometimes I don't understand. Sometimes I, I'm angry. You know, uh, I can talk about Norma because she's not here. She's up in Vacaville. And when I was over there in the middle of the night, and you can imagine the confusion of finding your husband passed away. And I said, Norma, you just got to be human. If you want to yell at God, get mad at God, do it. God is much bigger than your emotions. God isn't going to be offended because you're angry and confused. We all know Kubler Ross, death and dying techniques, you know, shock, anger, those things. I said, it's to be human. Because God is bigger than anything. We're so afraid of offending God. Do you think you can really offend the God who created the universe and gave his son? Don't you think he has this all in control? Does, don't you think he knows when you're not being honest with him? But if you can be honest with him and you know he still loves you, that builds trust. Because we all have had friends that we've chewed out, yelled at, screamed out, and they still say our friends. Do you trust them more? Of course you do. Because you know you don't have to try to please them. They just love you. And that builds trust. Marriage is, is a, another example. That's what Paul's trying to get them to. You got to have this in your thing. And so Paul says, I'd, I'd like to come and bless you. I really want to be there. But at the time, Paul's going the opposite way. He's going to Jerusalem. And he says, I wish I could be there. And, uh, but he also knows he can't set his own agenda. Paul doesn't do what he wants to do. Now look at this. Paul wants to come to Rome. If he came to Rome, they have a church. They're in a metropolitan city. He's a Roman citizen. He would be well taken care of. But Paul gets shipwrecked. He gets beaten. He gets thrown out of cities. He gets laughed at. He gets humiliated. Do you think he chooses to do this rather than go to Rome where he could have a nice, comfortable time? No. He doesn't want to do that, but he wants to do what God wants him to do. Why? Because God has always been trustworthy. Because whatever happens, it builds something. And when Paul looks back and says, oh, it was tough, but now there's a church. He said, I want to come to you. Because let me tell you, it's better when you're talking to people to tell them the truth than to make promises you never will keep. I have a friend that all the time. Hey, listen, I really want to come to your church. I really want, and we need to go to England. Okay. I've been hearing this for like five years. And then next year I'll see them and they'll say the same thing. Do you think I have trust in this person? No. But if somebody says, listen, I would really like to do this, but I can't see a way for the next five years that I'll ever have the break to do it. At least now I can deal with it. Truth hurts, but lies will kill you is an old saying, one of my favorites, you know, and this is what Paul, Paul says, I want to come. I'm not making fake promises. I really do want to come, but my life is not my own, you know, and so if God leads me, I'm going to come, and I'm not using God as an excuse to keep away from doing something. That was the different from Paul. So he shows up, and he says he wants to impart this spiritual gift, and we've talked about that, the presence of God, you know, and he said, I'm not going to bring, you know, uh, healing or tongues or testimony. But he said, I want you to be built up. So how are people built up? You know, how are we going to do it? It can't just be Paul is going to preach the gospel wherever he goes. That's, doesn't, that goes without saying. Paul says, you know, you take me in Rome, I'm going to stand on the street corner and I'm going to preach. Or I'm going to go to the synagogue. I'm going to preach. He said, but with the body, I, he shouldn't be able to have to preach because they're saved. But we have to learn what are the things that edify us. You know, like tongues. 
here's just one. The Bible says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He that prophesies edifies the church. So here's one thing that edifies. You know, the word, prayer, worship, community, fellowship. These are all things that help build up who we are. And that's one of the things we're called to do for each other. Not just to come and worship as a group where there's somebody singing or preaching and you guys are sitting there, but also to mutual build each other up. That is what the body is called for. And, and that's what he's trying to do it. So he comes down and leadership is encouraged as he sees and hears the congregation is living in faith. He hears about these things. And he said a lot of times people don't teach on that stuff about living in the faith because these people don't have leaders. It isn't like, oh, you know, Peter stopped there and Paul stopped there and Barnabas stopped there, kind of the parade of evangelists. They don't have this. They just have each other. But it says everybody's talking about you because they hear of your faith. So you guys must be doing a really good job to build each other up. And he said, I want to come and see that. It's very important. And I talked about how I big get built up as people talk about it. You know, and I've said this before, 70% of all ministers don't finish well. 70%. Seven out of 10 ministers don't finish well. And the number one reason, it isn't moral failure. It isn't embezzlement. It's because they get dragged down by the people in the church complaining and envying and divisions that they spend all their time trying to heal instead of the body healing itself. You know, I've made it very clear in here that I'm not here to take care of all you. We're here to take care of each other. That's what it's for. When something happens to somebody, there's a whole group of people that come around them. Yeah, I'm willing to help. That's not what I'm talking about. But we don't hire staff to do everything because then you don't have to do anything. That's not a community, folks. It's a pseudo community. There is no, and a lot of churches are pseudo communities. They talk a good talk, but let me tell you, they are not committed one to another. They're not even committed to the church. First time they hear a bad sermon or a song's too loud or the drums are too loud, they're gone. Well, how can you have community when that is your attitude? You know, Think of that in your marriage, you know. I, I would tell a joke, but I, I don't have time. Okay. But Paul wants them to know that this gospel is not an elite gospel. You know, this is not made, it's for everyone. It is for male, female, Jew, Greek, foolish, wise, rich, poor, culture, or uncultured. Paul says everyone on the planet deserves the love of God. And we have made a hierarchy of cultures uh, by race, creed, lifestyles, orientations. You know, it's amazing that we have done this when everything in the, the Bible goes against that at the core. Now, yeah, we have rules and regulations. I'm not talking about that, but at the core, you cannot get beyond the message that Jesus says you need to learn to love one another. This is what Paul says. And so I'm not coming here to go to the rich or the poor or, or the poor. You know, and sometimes there's churches that only minister to the poor. Oh, they're the ones who need it. Well, everyone needs it. Everybody that walks this earth needs to have a plan of salvation. And during this time, it was very common that the religions of the world in Rome and around the culture and society and philosophies were looking for a messiah. Because they had elevated culture to indulge about every fantasy you can imagine. I mean, the Romans, I mean, you talk about some of our perversions, they, they had taken it way beyond most of us. But they knew that at the end of that road, it was empty. They wanted to have something. That's what Paul's trying to step into. And people may be around you think that they have it all together and they have what they need. But there is a core whole inside of people that only Jesus fills. Paul knew this, and he paid the price for it, but he also knew that it reaped the fruit that it was supposed to. You can have a neighbor that doesn't want to hear anything about Jesus. Oh, I don't need that Jesus. I don't even want to hear about it. But I guarantee you, if you learn to love them, the change that will come over them to wonder, why are you loving them when other people haven't? Well, simple. 
the love of God through Jesus is in my heart. It's the only way I can love you, and I want to do that. And then it all of a sudden now becomes real. So Paul ends up, i got to end up because we're having communion, he ends up with these two important verses. He said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Are we ashamed of the gospel? You can be ashamed of the gospel in a lot of ways. If you don't want to talk about anybody that you're a Christian, you're ashamed of the gospel. Some people believe, well, I'm sorry, religion is private. Ah, yeah, I have read that book. It's not private. He said, I'm not ashamed of it. See, and for them, a lot of the Romans said, this is ridiculous. You know, we have complex, especially the Greeks, we have complex philosophies and logic and you have this little simple story about a guy dying on a cross and raising again. How, how stupid do you think we are? Paul said, oh, I'm not ashamed. It may be a simple message, but it is the power. It's not a power. It's not a power among powers. It is there, the only power that matters. And they talk about it not being the hinge on the door, but the door. It isn't a way that you can learn. It is the way. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes on to the Father but by me. He said, it's not just a enabling you. It is the only way you can do it. And this is what Paul is trying to say to him. And he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he includes everybody. I mean, you either were a Greek means a non-Jew. So it doesn't mean just somebody from Greek descent. So he's just saying a Jew or a non-Jew. Well, who? everybody in the world is either a Jew or a non-Jew. I mean, you can't be anything else. So he said this gospel, the simplicity of it is one of the most amazing things about it, that God had this. He didn't come to take the Old Testament and improve on it. He radically turned it upside down. He dissolved the law and all the rules and regulations, and then he rebirthed a whole new environment, a genesis again in the universe based on who Jesus is. And so he says, the Jew first, for in it is in the righteousness or rightness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And see, we interpret that legally, the righteous. The better you are at controlling your emotions and your desires and your lust, the better you are at living by faith. But we have forgot exactly what Paul said about Abraham. Abraham was considered righteous. He's a patriarch of the Old Testament. He's one of the leading fathers of the Jewish faith even before the Ten Commandments or anything. How did Abraham become righteous? He believed God. And it was accounted to him as righteous. It's the same for you. Your righteousness has nothing to do with what you do or don't do, or what you believe or don't believe. Those things are important. But your righteousness comes by what God has done and what God has promised, and what God has revealed to us. We live by faith because we are righteous, because the righteousness we have is because we believe in the trustworthiness of God, that he has set us apart, he has called us as a community, and he has called us to change the world. Let's pray. God, we are grateful to you. In so many ways we can't even express we see things that you have done that seem so simple and yet are so incredibly mind-blowing. Help us to live by faith, real faith, the faith that trusts you for everything, trusts you in our walk, trusts you to live in the moment, trusts you to live in this community and encourage one another. As the Bible says, as long as there's daylight, we need to encourage one another because darkness will come. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we live in this country where we can express your word freely and openly. And you have blessed. In your name we pray. Amen.
Now, communion we're doing, you're sitting there because we just didn't know how many people would be here. Does everybody have communion or does anybody need, did everyone, anybody, if you need a communion cup, it has the wafer and the cup. If you need one, raise your hand. Uh, Sandra up here needs one. You know, I, I, I think, you know, God, you know, we learn all this stuff, we study all this stuff, and we're amazed by all this stuff. And I think God kind of planned for communion to just kind of lay all that aside. Because I think he said, you know, when it all comes down to it, this is it. You can have the mysteries of the world. You can understand wisdom and knowledge. You can have great insight into Scripture. But it all starts with God and it ends with God. And God says, it ends with my son. It began with my son. When he came and lived and died, that was the beginning of a genesis that changed the universe that you were part of. I set you aside. I made you a piece of that puzzle. But I did it. You didn't. You'll never do it. I, I'm encouraged when you do right things, when you love people like you're supposed to love and you do the right things. I'm encouraged by that. God says, says I like that. But I also know that you live by the Spirit. You're filled by the Spirit. And if you abide in Jesus, Jesus says, if you abide in me, it'll keep flowing out of you. So it begins and it ends with God and Jesus. So the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. You kind of are at the end of the process. You enjoy the fulfillment of who I am and what I did. You weren't there. I, I had to go through this. I gave my body that you might be sitting here today and saying, isn't God wonderful? Yes, God is wonderful. But realize it came at a price. And only I do that to show you how valuable you are. Jesus didn't pay the price for himself. He didn't pay it for God or the Holy Spirit. They didn't need it. But he said, I'm willing to give my life because you are so important and I have so much for you that I'm willing to give my life and lay it down for you. So let us eat and let us believe. Same night, day, took a cup. <clears throat> he said, I'm moving you into a new economy. I'm moving you into a new ecosystem. I'm moving you into a new dynamic, a paradigm. You don't even understand what it will be. But I gave you the entry point. I gave my life for you. But there's something else you'll need. You'll need the power to live this life. And I'm going to give it to you. Like I said, it begins in me, ends in me. My blood is shed for you. Perfect blood. No sin. No sacrifice was needed. But I freely give it <coughs> that you might be whole, empowered, and victorious. Let us drink in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
man. We're going to move over to the thing. I want you to, you know, thank, uh, as you're over there, when you, if you haven't been in the fellowship hall, it's amazing. They just came down yesterday and did an amazing job. Katie and her uh, committee, they're in here, and uh, Helen and Kathy and all sorts of people. So thank them when they do it. They're out there cooking food for you guys because they want to celebrate as a community. So let's pray. God, we are thankful. We are blessed today, you not only for the country, but for our community and for our friends. But most of all, we're blessed because you came and you gave us life and life abundantly. You came to set us free and to make us whole. You came for us to be new creation, that we might be lights and darkness, salt in the earth. And you did it all freely before we even heard or knew of you. You had already planned to send your love through your son. We thank you in your name we pray and everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. You can go out these doors. They're all ready for you over there.